our intention in the last year or two has been focused on the pandemic and SARS-CoV-2. But the number one cause of death, or at least traditionally perceived the number one cause of death has been heart disease. So we thought we'd circle back and examine that in more detail because Dr. Malcolm Kendrick has wrote such a masterful piece on the thrombogenic theory of heart disease and understanding how heart disease is formed will help you understand the pathology of cardiovascular disease, which impacts even newer disease like SARS-CoV-2 and how it dis can destroy and catalyze the damage to your cardiovascular system. So you're dying of a stroke or a heart attack. So you're really going to enjoy the information that we discuss in this interview. All of your blood vessels are lined with um, a thing called endothelial cells, a bit like tiles on the wall. The endothelial cells are also covered themselves in a thing called glycochelix. Uh, and you know, if you try to pick up a fish, it'll slip through your fingers. It's very slippery. The reason why it's slippery is because they're covered in glycochelix. And the glycocalyx is nature's Teflon. So basically, um, in our case, we did, our, our glycocalyx sticks inside into our blood vessels to allow the blood to travel through without, without it sticking, without damage occurring. So you have this kind of damage repellent layer um, on top of your cells, your endothelial cells. Now, if that layer is damaged and then the endothelial cell itself underneath is damaged, then the only thing that all the body will do is it will immediately say, oh, we've got damage to a blood vessel. We must have a blood clot here because we could be about to bleed out. So the blood clot forms on the area of damage. The COVID virus enters endothelial cells through the ACE2 receptor. It gets into the endothelial cell, starts replicating, bursts out, damages the cell. Bingo, you've got an area of damage. Of course, added to this, when cells have viruses within them, they send out distress signals to the to the immune system saying, I've been infected, come and kill me. And so the immune system starts to really have a go at the endothelial cells. And this is why you can get um, a problem because the endothelial cells are being damaged and stripped off. Blood clotting occurs at the points of damage. And hey, presto, you're having clotting, you're having problems, you're having strokes, you're having heart attacks, which is, which is the thing that people at first thought they couldn't understand. And yet it, it's very clear what's happening is you've got damage to the endothelial cells. We have to keep our glycocalyx healthy and we have to keep our endothelial cells underneath them healthy. Otherwise they will be damaged and stripped off and then we will get a blood clot and then that blood clot. And if we keep getting blood clots at that point, we will end up with a plaque. And eventually one of the blood clots that hits on that plaque will kill you from a heart attack or a stroke. Welcome everyone, Dr. Mercola, helping you take control of your health. And today we have a repeat guest, but one who's not been on for quite some time, uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. And he, like me, is a board certified family physician. Uh, uh, but unlike me, he has chosen to commit a good portion of his professional life to uncovering the mechanism as to exactly why the number one cause of death, at least historically, the last century has been heart disease. And he's uncovering the causes. Now, we could possibly make a pretty strong argument that the number one cause of death today is not heart disease. It is exposure to the jab. So the statistics will probably support that in a not too distant future, but that's my speculation. But that's another area. Interestingly, heart disease is a side effect of the jab too. And, and Dr. Kendrick has written a new book called The Clot, C-L-O-T, Clot Thickens, really great title. And it, it's a, it, the title is also reflective of the sense of humor he it, it traces throughout the entire book. I mean, he's really, it's a pleasure to read because he's just so entertaining when he's describing this important thing. And I really process rather, I really believe it's a crucial bit of understanding to have because it's so, uh, counters the traditional lipid hypothesis as to the cause of heart disease. And he's written several books before then, and he'll review those with us before we, once we start talking. But, but um, this is one of the best, I think, because it really goes into great details and gives you some solid strategies 
as to how to lower your risk and, and have the necessary biological understanding of what the, the process is. And, how, and then, so once you understand that, you can understand how interventions like, like SARS-CoV-2 or the jab can actually contribute to heart disease. So you're going to be excited with this one and I'm really happy to um, have you today, Dr. Kendra. So we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure. And uh, I very much respect you uh, at the moment. Uh, can I call you Joe? Sure, sure, uh, absolutely. For, for the uh, for the very, very brave stance you've taken uh, against some of the most egregious and and scary kind of uh, attacks that people have had to suffer. In in my uh, in my memory, I can't remember anything like this, and it's really quite no, scary. No. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And uh, it's really quite easy for me. It's, it's, it's just like falling off a log because this is what I've been doing for the last quarter century. It's really nothing different other than they've changed the game a little bit. But we've been, that's what the whole newsletter was based on. Fundamentally, it initially was started to educate people about the, fun, the foundational causes of the disease so they can address them with simple strategies that weren't very expensive, usually involving lifestyle changes and maybe some supplements, but primarily diet and exercise and sleep. And uh, by doing that, they can avoid the, the needless pain and suffering by committing to the conventional medical paradigm, which invariably almost never, never addresses the fundamental cause of disease. And you certainly go over that shades of that in, in your book. So uh, yeah, it's just, it's just fun. I love doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't do anything else, you know, so it's I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to to uh, participate in this dialogue. So, but anyway, I really enjoyed your book. It was very, very good. And uh, as I said, I think it really provides a foundation of all understanding. So we're gonna let you walk us through it because you've done such a magnificent job and I'm sure we're gonna get lo loads of your humor, humor in our dialogue. So why don't you go for it and maybe tell us why you, why you decided to write it and then we would basically go over the specifics. And I have a few questions for you and we can dialogue about it as we go into it. Uh, but I, I really want you to lay the basis and the foundation for your work. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, um, uh, when people say, you know, why do you write a book? Why do you put this effort in? Um, and people say, why are you so interested in, in heart disease? Uh, well, I go back and, uh, and say that when I was training as a, a student in medicine, uh, Scotland had the highest rate of heart disease in the world. Uh, that's what everyone said, and I think it it may even be true because heart disease statistics are are swines to get hold of. But um, and um, quite early on, uh, you know, people were saying, "Well, why does Scotland have such a high rate of heart disease?" And the answer was, "Oh, well, it's because we have such a terrible diet, and um, and we eat um, deep fried Mars bars and we eat rubbish food, and this is why Scotland has such a high rate of heart disease." So I thought, well, uh, you know, when you're at medical school and you're told stuff, you just kind of in, in, it all comes into your brain and you don't question it greatly because you've got so much stuff that's coming in, so many facts to remember, a billion facts a day. And, and then, you know, so you eat, you eat too much saturated fat, the saturated fat gets turned into cholesterol in your bloodstream and then it, uh, it just absorbed into your arteries and it forms narrowings and thickenings, which all sounds sort of plausible if you don't think about it too hard. But I also happen to go to France quite a lot. And, and in fact, I'm in France at the moment. <laughs> yeah, managed to get there. And um, uh, what I noticed about France was they eat a lot of saturated fat and they eat more, in fact, than anyone else in Europe. Um, and they ate, certainly ate more than they did in Scotland. So the idea that diet, through the simple, if you like, diet heart hypothesis, you eat, you eat too much fat, saturated fat, your cholesterol level goes up and then you die of heart disease certainly didn't work for the French. And in fact, the statistics on the French are that they have the highest saturated fat intake in Europe and the lowest rate of heart disease. And this has been the case for decades. Um, and if you looked at all the risk factors for Scotland and France, which I did in a lot of depth, was that things like smoking, the French smoked more, exercise, exercise was about the same, et cetera, et cetera. Blood pressure was the same, rate of diabetes was approximately the same. So if you took all the risk factors for France and, Heart and Scotland, then uh, the French had slightly worse, in a, according to conventional thinking, they should have 
more heart disease than the Scots. And in fact, they had a fifth, one fifth aged, aged sort of um, matched, um, and especially in younger men. So I thought, well, well, okay, this is interesting. Uh, it doesn't make much sense according to the what we're told. And then while I was at medical school, in fact, I had a, a, a tutor in cardiology, and uh, her name is Elspeth Smith. And she said something to a small group tutorial, which was, uh, LDL cannot cross the endothelium. Um, uh, at the time, I didn't know what LDL was, uh, nor did I know what the endothelium was. But it kind of sounded important. And in fact, that triggered thinking, which uh, I wish I'd had a chance to speak to her more, but I didn't. She's now certainly dead. But she, she had been looking at heart disease as a different process for, for decades. And she wrote a great deal. In fact, when I was reading papers by E. Smith, I didn't actually make the connection initially. I thought, who's this Edward Smith? Because at that time, women didn't write scientific papers and they definitely weren't cardiologists, uh, how the world changes. But um, so I was kind of on this pathway. Um, and I think that's really where I got started. And um, once you start questioning, the problem is you end up questioning more and more and you start thinking, gosh, this is just nonsense, isn't it? This whole hypothesis is just nonsense. So I started, if you like, picking it apart and, and I've spent the last, I hate to tell you how long I've spent picking it apart, uh, but I was never quite able to think, well, what, what is the alternative? If it's not LDL, if it's not cholesterol, if it's not saturated fat, if these are not the primary causes, what is it? And boy, that's a long and complicated yeah, and, the, and the, your book, The Clot Thickens, is an attempt to resolve that question. So, uh, and I, I'm, I'm impressed with your curiosity. It's something that essentially gets squashed out of almost everyone who goes and starts medical school. By the time they finish, it's gone, and they're just accepting the conventional dogma. So, kudos to you for maintaining that curiosity and helping us understand some of the foundational causes of disease. So, why don't you, if it's not the saturated fat and cholesterol, what is it? Well, the hypothesis is that it's actually been around for um, uh, since 1852. Um, mm -hmm. um, a researcher in, in Vienna called Karl von Rokitansky, um, and he called it the encrustation hypothesis. But I, I, I did more other people talking about it now would call it the thrombogenic hypothesis. Thrombo is basically thrombosis, which basically means blood clots, and genesis basically means the genesis means the cause of or the start of. So the thrombogenic hypothesis is that blood clots are the uh, basic um, pathology that causes all heart disease. So essentially trying to make it as simple as possible in your arteries, if a blood clot forms on your artery wall, which can happen for a number of reasons, uh, mostly it will be covered over, dissolved away and gone. So this is a common process that's probably happening, I hate to say it, in a, most people's arteries quite a lot of the time. But the problem you have is if you get a blood clot that forms and then is not got rid of fully, or another blood clot forms at that point, you then have a focus for what they call the atherosclerotic plaque. So the atherosclerotic plaque is basically a buildup of blood clot repair, blood clot repair, blood clot repair. And if the blood clotting process is faster than the repair process, you have a plaque that gradually grows and eventually thickens the, the artery wall till it narrows sufficiently that the final blood clot on top of the existing plaque is the thing that can cause heart attacks and strokes. And that that's the, does that make sense like that? Is that straight? Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. You, that one of your gifts is to simplify things in a way that's easy to understand. So thank you. Well, thank you. And so I think, um, so people say, well, how can this possibly be? And how could people not have known this? And da 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 And I say, well, if you, if you look at heart disease now, the, the, the mainstream will agree entirely that the final event in heart cardiovascular disease or atherosclerotic plaques or what they now call atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, unfortunately, the terminology runs and jumps around on you all the time. But basically what you have is you have an artery and then in one part of the artery, there's a, there's, there's a thickening and it, it doesn't actually act like a thickening. The, the total artery size goes, it remains as a, as a sort of circular tube, but the thickening sticks out on one side and then eventually causes the whole thing to contract down. But conventional thinking is that, yes, 
the final event in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which I'll just call heart disease because otherwise it gets too much of a mouthful. A plaque, a clot forms on that point. It blocks an artery completely. That's when you have a stroke or a heart attack. So everyone accepts that blood clots cause the final event. And increasingly, people will accept, and you can find that it's written in very many, you can find hundreds, thousands of journal articles that, that the plaques, when they grow, they don't gradually grow. Plaques suddenly jump in size, which represents a blood clot forming on that point, which does not, it's not large enough to fully block the artery, so you don't get a stroke or a heart attack. But it, then the repair process occurs, but you're left with a thickening. So they did research on people who've known to have plaques in their coronary arteries, and then they scanned them every, I think it was six months, but it might have been a year. And what they found was that the plaques didn't gradually get bigger and bigger as one molecule of LDL got absorbed, and then another one and another one and whatever. What happened was they were that size. Then when they looked a year later, they were suddenly that size, or they were that size. They jumped in what they call a phasic, jump, jump, jump. And if you look at some of the plaques that people have and you cut through them and you look at them, they're almost like tree rings where you can see there's been a, a clot repair, clot repair, clot repair, clot repair over years. And these are pretty widely accepted. Well, the, well, the first part's accepted. The second part is widely accepted that blood clot forming on an existing plaque will cause the plaque to grow in size. You can find 10,000 papers saying that this is the case. But what the mainstream won't accept is that a blood clot on a healthy artery wall can initiate the whole process. So to an extent, all I'm saying to people is, well, we know blood clots cause the final event. We know blood clots cause plaques to grow. Why won't you accept that blood clots are the thing that starts it in the first place? Because then we have one process all the way through. And, and it makes sense because it fits with what you can see. But no, the mainstream says that what happens at the start is LDL gets into the artery wall it initiates the plaque, and then what? Then it stops initiating the plaque, then it stops working, and then the plaque grows through repeated clots. Once you start near drilling down into the cholesterol, aka low-density lipoprotein hypothesis, it immediately starts to disintegrate in front of your eyes. And no one talks about process from that side. They just say, well, this is what happens. This is what happens. This is what happens. Oh, well. This was accepted yeah. fact. It's not. Yeah. Well, well it, is the, it, it is now written, uh, the last thing I saw from the European Society of Cardiology was it's no longer a hypothesis, it is a fact. LDL causes heart disease. It, so, so there can't be any discussion, uh, in fact, to discuss. Well, there can case. be, but you'll be censored and yeah. banned, yeah. And eventually kicked off of social media <laughs> because you violate the mainstream narrative. Um, well, I'm afraid that, yeah, you probably are. You have some expertise in in, uh, in getting thrown off Wikipedia, which I did a few years ago and got put on. Well, I'm, I've never thrown off. No, I'm too important. I'm, 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 it's not very humble, but I perceive that I'm too important from their perspective to kick me off of Wikipedia. They keep me there and just use it as a, as a me means to discredit me. So yeah, well, I'm on, anything uh, that's true, but can be twisted to make me look like, you know, make me look really bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm on, is it Rational Wiki or Rational, whatever it's called, where, where they just twist, you know, uh, as you know, I, I'm, I, I am known to make an occasional joke. Sure. And, sure. Uh, and of course, if you occasional. make a joke, the occasional joke, and if you make a joke uh, and then someone writes it down and says, Dr. Kendrick states this, you know, I think I said something like, you know, I, I have been known to be wrong, uh, but I did, I think it's happened once in 10 years or something, just a silly comment. Yeah, yeah. And they go, Dr. Kendrick believes he had never been wrong except once in 10 years. This man is a complete idiot. And you think, yeah, well, okay. You know, uh, you'll find, as you know yourself, they will twist and manipulate anything against mm -hmm. you. Uh, uh, well, it's interesting. They never attack you on facts. They just attack you. And this man is an idiot. You know, he's dangerous. He's attacking a fact. He states this. And it is it's pathetic. But it it still seems to work, doesn't it? You'd go for the man, not for the ball. It's, it's very, it's very uh, it's successful and efficient in achieving their, their goals. So no question. So how have they uh, attacked you on this thrombogenic theory that you- oh, well, I've been, well, I've been attacked. Well, in fact, uh, I haven't been attacked on the thrombogenic theory at all yet, as far as I am aware. 
-hmm. it's still very much that they say, well, we know that LDL causes heart disease and therefore you must, you're wrong. So they don't actually say, if they start, if they start going into the, the detail of, well, well, what's wrong with this hypothesis? Where does it go wrong? What's wrong with it? They go, well, what's wrong with it is that LDL causes heart disease. So you you can't be right. Yeah, but no, let's discuss process. Let's discuss how things can happen. Mechanism, sure. Mechanism. Yeah. Let's go down to mechanism because in the end, it everything is a everything. Well, is everything about mechanism? Everything has to be about. You have to have a mechanism for something. Well, it that, helps. It helps when you understand it because then you can put the pieces of the puzzle together. So why don't we? Why don't you start outlining your mechanism that you that seems. It, it, it seems you're spot on. I mean, I, I have no dis, disagreements with that mechanism at all. It's okay. brilliant. Well, I think the mechanism itself is, well, I was looking at a very, very bright man called Paul Roche, who's uh, helped to set up the American Institute mm-hmm. of Stress and sadly died last year. At, uh, oh, did he? Yeah, he yeah, used to get his emails, yeah. Uh, brilliant guy. And I was banging my head off the wall. And uh, he said, you're looking at this. Your trouble is you're looking for causes and what you need to look at is process. And I thought, what's he talking about? And then I realized he was quite right Mm -hmm. in that you had to look down and say, well, what's actually happening that can explain what we see and it can explain why certain things are causing it. So, yeah, Yeah, it's interesting. Paul's work was in stress and your theory accommodates how stress can cause heart disease, which is brilliant. Uh, Well, I I was a big stress man for, for a long time. I thought stress was the answer to everything. Uh, and then I kept finding things like smoking that caused heart disease. And I thought, well, actually, it doesn't really relate to stress or some weird conditions like uh, sickle cell disease. I thought, well, I can't relate that to stress. And a number of, I mean, unless you did it very, you know, you twisted and bent everything to, to match, which which is something you don't really want to do. It's what I've accused the LDL side of doing is you, you twist and turn and manipulate. But, you know, I have said that stress is important. But Paul Roche was... Was a mechanism was looking at mechanisms he told me what this don't look at causes look at process and then i started looking at it i thought okay so what is the process and of course I'm, I'm 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 running through about you know several years of thinking and research but essentially all of your blood vessels are aligned with um a thing called endothelial cells a bit like tiles on the wall of course far more complicated than that and these cells are also, uh, and most, if you ask most doctors, they're not aware of this, is that all these cells, all the endothelial cells are also covered themselves in a thing called glycocalyx. Uh, and you know, if you try to pick up a fish, it'll slip through your fingers. It's very slippery. The reason why it's slippery is because they're covered in glycocalyx and the glycocalyx is incredibly slippery. It's, na- it's nature's Teflon. So basically um, in our case, we, our, our glycocalyx doesn't stick out of our cells into the into the air but it sticks inside into our blood vessels to allow the blood to travel through without without it sticking without damage occurring so you have this kind of damage repellent layer um, on top of your cells your endothelial cells now if that layer is damaged and then the endothelial cell itself underneath is damaged then the only thing that well the body will do is it will immediately say oh we've got damage to a blood vessel we must we must have a blood clot here because we could be about to bleed out so the blood clot forms on the area of damage it immediately stops you know the the blood clot doesn't just immediately grow and grow and grow otherwise we would die every time you have a blood clot so as the blood clot forms there's a whole lot of other processes going stop 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 so the blood clot forms it sticks if you like sticks to the to the to the wall and then and this is the problem that rocky tansky had because he said how can you find blood clots inside an artery wall because all cells are all arteries and all blood vessels are lined by this endothelium, and we see the plaque underneath the endothelium. So how can that possibly be? And he couldn't answer that question, and that's uh, why his. But you can. <laughs> well, well, the answer is very simple. Is because of course when the clot forms, the endothelial cells are not there; they've been stripped away, and within the bone marrow, new endothelial cells, what they call progenitor cells, because they're early stage cells. They're floating around in your bloodstream. If they see an area of damage on a blood vessel wall, they attach themselves to it and grow and form a new endothelial layer. It's just one cell thick. And then you now have a blood clot inside the artery wall and all the repair processes kick in on that. 
So what you, the first thing that you've got to say is, well, what damages the endothelium? What can you find to damage the endothelium? Well, you know, how would you do that? Well, uh, we jumped slightly towards COVID and, uh, and COVID-19. The COVID virus enters endothelial cells through the ACE2 receptor uh, because it prefers endothelial cells because they've got ACE2 receptors on them. It gets into the endothelial cell, starts replicating, bursts out, damages the cell, bingo, you've got an area of damage. Of course, added to this, when cells have viruses within them, they send out distress signals to the, to the immune system saying, I've been infected, come and kill me. And they send messages to other cells. And so the immune system starts to really have a go at the endothelial cells. And this is why you can get um, a problem because the endothelial cells are being damaged and stripped off. Blood clotting occurs at the points of damage. And hey, presto, you're having clotting, you're having problems, you're having strokes, you're having heart attacks, which is which is the thing that people at first thought they couldn't understand. And yet it, it's very clear what's happening is you've got damage to the endothelial cells. So you're moving on from COVID. You know, obviously you, you and I both know that if you inject, uh, if you have a vaccine injection, that the cells are, are, are triggered um, mm -hmm. to, 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 to produce um, this, the, the spike protein and, and the cells are sending out distress messages at that point going, you know, I, I'm infected. Um, so, so you have to be very careful if you want to stick uh, in something into cells that then, then says to the immune system, please come and, and destroy me, because that's what the immune system is going to do. Uh, but moving on from that, what other things can cause endothelial damage or damage to the endothelial cell? Well, the answer is things like smoking. Mm -hmm. the smoke particles, if you inhale smoke, small, very small nanoparticles get out of the, your lungs, they go into your blood vessels and they cause damage because they've got healthy volunteers smoking one cigarette who don't who are not normally smokers you can measure the breakdown products of endothelial cells are called microparticles so you smoke one cigarette and a whole bunch of microparticles appear in your bloodstream which means endothelial cells are dying you're killing them off luckily as endothelial cells die another message is sent to the bone marrow saying we need more endothelial cells and it stimulates the endothelial progenitor cell production so these endothelial progenitor cells rush around, covering over the areas of damage. So, so, so long as, in, as again, in this case, so some smokers have got enough repair going on. And when you're younger, it's okay. As you get older and your repair systems begin to, to fail a bit, cigarette smoking becomes more and more of a problem. So there's other things that can obviously cause damage is, um, is, is um, diabetes, high blood sugar levels, because the glycocalyx is made of proteins and sugars. So the glycoprotein layer is what it is, little fronds, little, looks like a lawn or, 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 or something of that sort under a, an electron microscope. But um, high blood sugar level damages the glycoprotein layer. And you can see it, you can measure it, it can be measured. You can watch it shrinking. And, um, uh, and this, of course, exposes the endothelial cells to the bloodstream and all the potential damaging effects that can occur here. One of the primary ones being the glycocalyx stops blood clotting. It's an enormously potent anticoagulant layer. And it contains- so Maybe you can ex explain what the glycocalyx is because I'm sure many, many people have heard of it, but they, they don't know what it is. And I think oh, yeah, well, well, even in your book, you asked that question to a variety of physicians and no one knew what well, it was. Well, it, it said, no, no one yet, <laughs> no doctor yet that I've spoken to has ever heard of it. Uh, it's, it's like hugely important thing. It's like a hugely important thing no one's ever heard of. Uh, but as I say, every cell is almost like, you know, you've heard of, of, of you know, you've seen um, bacteria that move themselves by, by little wiggly things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and essentially it's, it's little, they stick through the endothelial uh, membrane. And they're like, they're, they're, I say, if you look at it under a microscope, it's like a, it's like a lawn, if you like just mm -hmm. tendrils and, and filaments. And, and within this, this, this uh, glycocalyx layer, you have what's called nitric oxide synthesis, which is the, the thing that produces nitric oxide. You've got nitric oxide itself. You've got various anticoagulant proteins. It's an incredibly complicated layer. It's like a jungle full of things that say, don't stick to this, do not clot on this, stay away from this. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and also within it is incorporated with albumin, which is a very common protein that's produced by the liver and it contains the proteins that albumin contains the proteins that will help 
to repair the glycocalyx layer if it's damaged. So when you look at things like uh, chondroitin sulfate, for instance, chondroitin and uh, oh, what's the other one? Um, these proteins are, are, are NSM. Are, MSM. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All the, these are the, the proteins that help to keep the glycocalyx layer uh, repaired. So in fact, interestingly, if you have a low albumin level in your blood, you're far more likely to die of heart disease. Now you try and explain that through the LDL mechanism and it makes, this doesn't anywhere work. And if I say to people, they did discover that if you give chondroitin sulfate as a supplement, which is normally used for arthritis in your knees and stuff like that, that it reduces the risk of heart disease quite considerably. Now, how, how do you explain that? Well, they explain that because you're protecting your glycocalyx. So these are the sort of things that make no sense if you like looking at the conventional ideas of heart disease, but are immediately and easy to explain if you say, okay, so we have to keep our glycocalyx healthy and we have to keep our endothelial cells underneath them healthy. Otherwise they will be damaged and stripped off and then we will get a blood clot and then that blood clot. And if we keep getting blood clots at that point, we will end up with a plaque and eventually one of the blood clots that hits on that plaque will kill you from a heart attack or a stroke. And so it's, you then start looking and saying, well, what things damage the endothelium? Well, lead poisoning damages the endothelium. Mm -hmm. Any heavy metal that you, you inhale, you, you, you have in your body will, will damage the endothelium, aluminium, for instance, anything that's toxic like that, high blood sugar levels. And obviously the blood pressure, a high blood pressure is putting extra stress onto your endothelial cells. Your blood is turbulent and it's crashing about. In your veins, there's very little pressure and there's very little, if you like, what I call biomechanical stress on your arteries. And you never get atherosclerosis in your veins mm -hmm. or, or in fact, in the blood, in the blood um, vessels Thunder. in your lungs. So yeah, but to an extent, you need a degree of blood pressure to trigger um, heart disease. And of course, in the heart itself, the arteries that supply the heart are probably under the greatest stress of, of any arteries in your body. The heart is contracting and expanding and the blood vessel. In fact, the, the blood does not flow through the heart, uh, uh, blood vessels, the coronary arteries, when it contracts because the pressure is so high. It only, it only goes through when it's relaxed, which gives you some idea of the constant pounding that a coronary artery is under. And someone said it's like stomping on a, on a garden hose 60 times a minute. Yeah, and the other and if we could just stop you, just expand a little bit uh, because of the reason it is kind of surprising that you wouldn't, you don't observe atherosclerosis in the pulmonary arteries or arterial vasculature. And that's primarily because the pressure is so much lower. Well, I believe so. I mean, and if you do get the blood pressure up and you can get pulmonary hypertension, which is pulmonary just means lungs and hypertension, and high blood pressure. If you, if you have a state of pulmonary hypertension, you can get plaques. There, is, there are conditions where you get um, 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 uh, holes in the, in, the, mm -hmm. in the heart, if you like. If they go from one sure. side, the, the ventricles, then the blood pressure from the left side of the heart can end up going into the right side of the heart and into the lungs. It's called Eisenmenger syndrome. It doesn't really matter what it's called. But you will develop plaques in these situations mm -hmm. and, and the higher blood pressure. And you can have some people who have ancillary blood vessels that come out of the left side of the heart and go into the lungs. And you will get atherosclerosis in these vessels because the higher blood pressure is doing it. There, there's no other reason for it. You know, as I say to people, well, if you don't think it's this, well, you can, if you're having a coronary artery bypass, they take a vein out of your leg, which has mm -hmm. no atherosclerosis in it. They put it into your heart. And within a few years, quite an awful, very rapidly, it will develop atherosclerotic plaques. So it's not that veins cannot develop atherosclerotic plaques or atherosclerosis. It's just that they never do unless the pressure is raised. So you, you have an answer. It's, it's, it's biomechanical stress, if that's a correct term. I don't really know if it is or not. It's one that I use myself. No, uh, it makes, it makes sense. But there's also metabolic stress. And you know I'm particularly intrigued with diabetes. That was one of the catalysts that got me thinking about what I was going to do after medical school. So obviously in diabetes, type 2 diabetes, adult onset typically, um, the blood sugar goes up. And then secondarily, you have insulin resistance, and the insulin resistance can cause the high blood pressure. But I'm wondering, in addition to the biomechanical stress you just mentioned, if there is a metabolic component from the high glucose, are there any direct toxic impacts from having running around with high glucose levels? Or is it the insulin that causes it? Well, uh, I think the problem is that, that I mean, insulin is 
in high levels, higher than normal physiological levels. Mm -hmm. It's quite a damaging substance to have in your body. There's no doubt about that. But you can show experiments where you 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 make people have high glute sugar levels. Mm -hmm. You can analyze, you can look at the glycocalyx and you can watch it going from like this thick to to this. Really? Thick. So it shrinks the glycocalyx? Yeah, the glycocalyx would say be would be would be a thickness of one. And and when you when you raise up the blood sugar, it can go down to a thickness of 0.3, say. I, 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 wow. Yeah, the units are irrelevant, but whatever. Can, it's a six yeah. to two-thirds reduction. You can see it happening. Wow. Um, because the glycocalyx can be destroyed very quickly. It can also self-repair very quickly. Um, they've watched white blood cells gain entry into blood vessels where they open up the blood vessels and squeeze through, which is a very complicated process. The glycocalyx is completely stripped off. One second later, it's completely repaired. Wow. So you can Impressive. see these things happening in real time. And in fact, if you have sepsis, um, in sepsis, the glycocalyx is severely damaged. And in fact, if you monitor the glycocalyx thickness in sepsis, it really tells you whether the person is probably going to live or die. Because wow. in sepsis, the exotoxins, which are external mm -hmm. toxins released by the bacteria, the first thing that they do is they attack the endothelium and the glycocalyx and strip it down. And they, they strip down the, the um the glycocalyx, the endothelial cells get damaged. And this is why you get widespread coagulation of sepsis. You get what's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. In other words, blood clots occurring all around your body, DIC. This is the thing that kills you with sepsis because it then blocks the blood supply in your organs and it blocks the blood supply to your periphery. So people who've had meningitis and they get the meningococcal toxins and their toxins they they lose their fingers because they lose all the circulation in their fingers. But this is the same, it's a more acute, it's obviously far more acute process that's happening with cardiovascular disease, but sepsis, you can see the glycocalyx being damaged. And as you treat people, you can see it wide, getting healthier and thicker. So you must keep it thin. And this is the reason in diabetes, why you don't just get large blood vessel disease, you also get the small blood vessel disease. Micro vessels, yeah, that's, that's classic for diabetes. The capillaries and the arterioles, the smallest blood vessels, like as wide as a red blood cell, 10 times as thin as a, as, as a hair or whatever it is, um, they're covered in glycocalyx as well. And when they're damaged, of course, you can't get atherosclerosis. You can't get a plaque in a capillary. Yeah. As I said, that's like a snake swallowing an elephant. There's mm -hmm. just no room. It can't occur. So what happens instead is, of course, the capillaries are just destroyed. Mm. So they break down. And you can see this. If people with diabetes are per circulation, you can look at the, the capillaries under their tongue using a device mm -hmm. that measures that. And, and you can see that some people have like 60 or 70% reduction in wow. the number of capillaries that they have. And of course, this is a real significant problem in your kidneys because your kidneys have these mm -hmm. incredibly complex blood vessels that make them work. And if they start getting knocked out, you lose your, your nephrons, if you like, there's the functional unit of the kidneys. And then then you start losing your kidney function. And of course, when you get small blood vessel problems, you get, you get problems with, the, with the, the skin and the circulation in your lower legs, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so, so, the, so you're getting a sort of peripheral damage. And so the peripheral damage means that, that the skin can break down and then you get ulcers. And it also the, the damage happens to the, neuro, the, small, the, the neurons, the, 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 the nerve cells, are no longer supplied by these final capillaries, so they can start to die off. So you get peripheral neuropathy, and also you get problems in your eyes, and you can see the damage in the eyes. It's the number one cause of blindness. Yes. Well, it, it, basically, the blood vessels... Diabetic retinopathy. Damaged. Yeah, basically, that's it, isn't it? So the blood vessels start to get damaged and damaged and damaged. It's the same process. It's glycocalic endothelial destruction. But, of course, in a small blood vessel, what happens is the blood vessels just destroyed or it bursts or you get an aneurysm or it blocks or whatever. So, so it's the same thing is happening. It's just on a micro scale and in diabetes, because, and I believe, and you can show this, that the, the, um, the, the glycocalyx is, is key here in all these blood vessels. So having a raised blood sugar is particularly damaging because you get the kidney damage. And with the peripheral circulation problems comes the high blood pressure, because obviously you're having to force the blood through less capillaries and less arterioles. And, and you're going to have to get the blood pressure up in order to, 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 to do that. So that's why you can get this problem with the raised 
raise blood pressure as well. It's all interconnected, isn't it? And of course, if you damage the kidneys, the kidneys are, are, are the places that send the messages to the bone marrow to produce the endothelial, new endothelial cells. So there's less new endothelial cells. So when you get chronic kidney disease, you get a reduction in endothelial progenitor cell production, and then the damage accelerates, if you like. So all these things interconnect, which is why the diabetes situation is, is I think, a triple whammy problem for people um, with heart disease. It's, it's, it's attacking everything in all directions at the same time. So it's, it's pretty nasty stuff. Yeah, I interviewed Jason Fung a few times, and he's a nephrologist out of Canada. And uh, who would have thought a nephrologist would go? To, he wound up, instead of treating kidney disease, he wound up refocusing his almost all of efforts to treating diabetes and doing that through fasting and derivatives of fasting to successfully prevent the damage from the first place rather than going in there after the fact. So it's really powerful. But as you were explaining that, um, you know, it occurred to me, wouldn't it be nice if the body could produce a chemical or a hormone that might just serve as fertilizer or nutrients, so to speak, for the endothelium? Yeah. And, may and maybe they call that vascular endothelial growth factor. <laughs> wouldn't that be nice to have? Wouldn't it be yeah. nice to engage in activities that would produce that in abundance? Yes, well, exactly. Uh, yeah. Vascular endothelial growth factor. Yeah, which is what it used to be called. And then he discovered that that factor was something no one, no one believed could possibly exist in the human body, nitric oxide, N-O, as I, as I like to call it. Which, N -O is, with a little, which is actually a free radical. It's no. the freest, I mean, everyone says, oh, well, free radicals are terribly damaging and heart, health and heart unhealthy. And I go, well, uh, you may wish to know that the chemical that is the single most important protective chemical in the, the body for the cardiovascular system is an incredibly free radical called nitric oxide. And, and the reason why the, the workers at Nobel's factories and going back years when they were stirring nitroglycerin by hand on a single legged stool because they didn't want to fall asleep and stop stirring, otherwise they'd be blown to smithereens. So mm -hmm. stirring nitroglycerin very slowly and breathing in the fumes, those that had angina, the angina went away. From that point, they realized that nitroglycerin was a good way of opening up your blood vessels. It's called glycerol nitrate, trinitrate, it's the same thing. And, and it turned into tablets and you stick them under your tongue and that opens up the blood vessels. But nitric oxide does far more than this, as you obviously know. It, it's called vascular endothelial growth factor and it stimulates endothelial growth, uh, endothelial progenitor cells. It protects the endothelium. It is anticoagulant. It's the most potent anticoagulant we have in the body. And it, it, it is really the molecule of, of the magic molecule for cardiovascular health, really, mm. if it goes down. So, so as you'd expect, and I wrote about this in the book, there are, can, there are uh, medications used to block vascular endothelial growth factor, which is actually a hormone. But, Usually um, anti-cancers, yeah. Yes, yeah. and they are anti-cancer drugs. EGF inhibitors. EGEF inhibitors. And, and so you would say, well, that's fine. It will stop cancer cells. Well, not all cancers, but certain cancers, they need what they call angiogenesis, the creation of new blood mm -hmm. vessels to feed themselves with enough nutrients. So they create VEGF. Or, um, but the main trigger end of VEGF is, is nitric oxide. And therefore, the, the tumor can grow and grow and grow and have enough nutrients. So if you can block VEGF, the tumor shrinks, and it does, and it's quite effective. But of course, you have this other problem, you're blocking VEGF, you're blocking nitric oxide. Well, you'd think if what I'm saying is true, you're going to see a big increase in heart disease, potentially, with these medications. And in fact, you do, and it's quite significant. So significant, these drugs were almost removed from the market, because despite their anti-cancer activity, they were pro-cardiovascular disease, to quite a scary degree. And, and of course, fascinatingly, if you were given is a bevazicumab or a Vastin as, a, as an anti-cancer drug, they now give you uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, which are ACE inhibitors, which are blood pressure lowering tablets. And, and ACE inhibitors have a specific impact on a hormone called bradykinin, which increases nitric oxide synthesis. So you use an ACE inhibitor to block the negative effects of the VEGF inhibitor, <laughs> of course. And then you loop around into the ACE inhibitor, A2, 
COVID discussion. So it is fascinating to me how once you start looking at it, it all comes ever, together. It's a it all puzzle. comes together. You think, what a complicated, I mean, how did, you know, this, this machine, the human body, what a beast it is. I mean, it, it's like you can lose yourself in. Yeah, I, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know, for sure. Oh, just, you know. So I have a few questions. So just to follow up from the, I don't think I understood the connection between nitric oxide and, and VEGF. So the, the nitric oxide stimulates the production of VEGF. Is that your contention? No, well, no, no, other way around. VEGF is the, a nitric oxide stimulator. Um, for NO. Yeah, NO. Um, so, okay, so geez, it, I what, what they found what, no, I didn't know that. So, so if you give people a Vastin, you can measure the NO and it goes it like, like that. I mean, really. Even if you give, it's actually used for macular degeneration. You stick it in the eye, and it, it's to do with reducing the amount of excess blood vessels that are created. Sure. And, and if you stick one injection in the eye, you can measure an enormously impressive decrease in nitric oxide synthesis in the whole of the rest of the body, just to give you some idea of how potent it is at reducing nitric oxide. Yeah, and there's several different enzymes that produce nitric oxide, but I suspect the one you're referring to is endothelial nitric oxide or ENOS, yes. which is yes. uh, the yes. good, that's the good one because there are bad the ones. Good. There's well, uh, well, it's always, it's always NOS bad and INOS and yeah. anyway. So I want, I want to go back to the uh, another example that you discuss in the book that I'm really familiar with, and that is that the NSAIDs can also interfere with this process. And although they may be, they're commonly, of course, used for anti-inflammatories and arthritis, but there was one reprehensible drug that was launched uh, in 2000, made by one of the, the most notorious companies in the world, Merck who uh, sold it, it was called Biox, at least in the United States. And I, when I believe it or not, in 1999, my newsletter was around and I wrote an article about that warning people, I believe it was the first public warning that this drug was gonna cause cardiovascular deaths. Five years later, 2004, they Merck pulled it off the market because they had killed 60,000 people. They moved it voluntarily. The speculation at the time is that they were going to have, they would potentially go out of business from bankruptcy because of the, all the lawsuits. There was, it was believed to be over $25 billion in lawsuits. They wound up settling for a billion, I think. They just manipulated the system and, and got out of their life. It was criminal action, reprehensible criminal action. They knew this was going to cause the deaths. They did it anyway. So why don't you go on and explain how these uh, NSAIDs interfere with that and how it all connects to the, to the thromogenic theory? Well, it's all the thromogenic theory because, uh, as you know, with NSA, the, 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 um, what, what they tried to do with, uh, with the Viox was, was actually quite a clever idea, which was that um, if you give NSAIDs, they block a thing called cyclooxygenase, mm -hmm. uh, which is an inflammatory uh, and, uh, cytokine, I think. Is it a cytokine? Um, and, uh, yeah. But the problem was that the... It's a prostaglandin, it's prostaglandin but it's prostaglandin, prostaglandin, it also, prostaglandin is our tysis yeah, and it also brought block production of COX two in the stomach, or was it COX one? I'm going to get this wrong way around. It blocked one of the COXs that caused the ulcers in your stomach. So mm -hmm. it's one of the one of the side effects of non NSAIDs is ulcers in your stomach. And there's two COXs, and if you block one, it blocks uh, the inflammation part, but it doesn't block the the, the stomach um, acid production part. So you you're protecting the stomach if you know the lining of the stomach. It's a lining of the stomach. But what they didn't realize was, of course, that there's other things going on in the body. And if you start blocking COX-2, then this is a significant impact on what they call platelet aggregation as well. And so the blood clotting system is more active, is increasingly activated. And so what they didn't realize, or they maybe they did realize, I don't know, what if you gave this, <laughs> the, the documentation internally showed that they did know? <laughs> they did. Well, I'm sure. It's, it's, they, these, it's, it's so frustrating. These people are so clever, and they look at these things, and they must they, they must be going. Somebody must have said, "Look, guys, this is going to cause blood clotting, and it's going to cause heart disease." And they knew. They, see, they saw it in the studies. That they had uh, well, I, well, we know that they they when they just never they reported in, they, it. Yeah. No, you 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 explained how they compare. They use it. The, it normally, you'd use a placebo compared to, but they compared it to another NSAID, which caused the problem. And they said, "Oh, it, 
it causes much less damage than this other or i forget they twisted it around well, nepro- they, well naproxen they, 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 they decided that naproxen was protective against heart disease. yeah yeah somebody had said this and then in fact naproxen causes heart disease but then they said oh well it's just it's it's just as good as as safe as naproxen <laughs> so therefore it's safe you go I mean, it was, it was, it was, you know, all those people, you know, it, they, they do the same it, tricks. And in fact, the same thing with stents, which you've written about before, the same, they employ the same strategies, you know, with actually conflating absolute and relative risk reduction, which we've discussed before. And they do it with the vaccines and they did the same darn things with the vaccines with this. Yes. They, they, they use a fake placebo. Oh, yes. And, 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 you know, and, and it gets even worse with, with, the, with the jabs, the studies, they just said, okay, after three months, we're going to eliminate the uh, placebo troop or the, 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 the yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, I think the placebo. No, 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 no one can have a placebo anymore because we know. No, the no one. You can't have a placebo. We're going to get rid of it because it's this damn jab is so good. Everyone needs it. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, you would, you know, I try and retain a sense of, <laughs> of, of humor because you, you, know, you, do, you, laugh, yeah. or you laugh or you cry. But I mean, my oh, yeah. God, when, you look, when you look at some of the stuff, I was just reading a, the Canadian um, uh, Concerned Physicians, oh, I think they're called. Oh, yeah, that was just beyond stupendous. A magnificent yeah. presentation they put together on that. And, and, uh, and you just look at that. I mean, I kind of knew, say, a number of the bits, but I'd never, I'd never bothered thinking them all through. But I just knew this was, you know, when people say to me, you analyze a clinical paper, I was like, uh, well, you know, I, I knew what was going on with the uh, the vaccination stuff very early doors, but uh, but but you know, you are you you are up against an implacable um, force in this one, I think. However, but you know, when it comes to biops, when it comes to but but it's it, the same it people, to, the same people driving that strategy are driving this. The same group, well, same group. It, it, well, of course it is, and it, because. Oh, it's, uh, to an extent, words fail me, but you try and explain this to people, and and I, and, I, and they they just eventually just say, "Well, I know it works, and I'm not going to listen to you," and 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 kind of that. that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, because they're, they're hypnotized. <laughs> well, uh, something about that, but I mean, yeah, I mean, the heart disease. I mean, people say, "Oh, well, statins lower LDL and they prevent heart disease," so we know LDL causes heart disease. It's the so same you, thing. Same thing. Did you ever heard of the of the of the citrapib drugs, of which there were four? Uh, which they spent billions researching, and so what, what is it? Is it tra- what's it, traffic? It's torsotrapid, evisotrapid, something else. Citrapid, I can't remember now. That's okay. just the generic title and okay. name. There's four of these drugs, and they were designed to lower LDL and raise HDL. So the, the final failure one, evisotrapid, raised HDL, the good cholesterol, the one that protects you, by 130 percent. It lowered LDL by 37 percent, which is more than most even potent statins achieve and it had absolutely no impact whatsoever on the cardiovascular disease rate in fact the first of the torsotrapid was the first of these drugs and it, it raised the cardiovascular disease by 55 percent relative risk increase and so you have a whole series of drugs that were super designed to do extra even better than than ldl lowering and they all failed and you say well you know so you're telling me we know statins work because they lower LDL and they protect you, prevent heart disease. I'm saying, well, here's a whole other bunch of drugs that lower LDL by even more and had no impact on heart disease. So that's what you call a black swan. Oh, it, was a neg- a it was a negative swan. impact. They, they increased it. It was a slightly, it was, there was a, overall, let's just be kind to them and say nothing happened. And yet, uh, to me, that's the classic black swan. It's a classic Popperian black swan. You say lowering LDL protects against heart disease. I say, look at these drugs. And, yeah. and they go, oh, yeah, well, that doesn't count. It's the okay. same thing for the jab. The jab marginally lowers your risk of developing severe illness, marginally. But they fail to mention that it radically increases your risk of dying, <laughs> which is a more important. And you know, the recent statistics <laughs> come out, oh, yeah. 40% increase in death rate last year from the from a life insurance company out of indiana so and i think the independent companies the uh, are going to support this 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 fact because you know the the government is certainly isn't going to provide those statistics so but it's the same process it's the same damn strategy that they're using 
Oh, well, you've seen it, yeah. The, 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 the other ones, the, the, um, the PC, PS, PCSK9. PCSK9 inhibitors, right. Yeah, what do you even call it? I can't remember what it stands for. Polycrine and something or that. Anyway, they, they lower LDL even more. And the first one that came out, they were going about how wonderful it was and how stupendous it was and a reduction in cardiovascular events by this and that. And when you looked at it, the overall mortality was higher in the, in the, in the, in the active drug group than in the placebo. And you go, well, okay, so call me old-fashioned, but I'm going to take a drug. Then, then the one primary thing I want it to do is stop me dying. And if it doesn't do that, you can basically... Yeah, but it is, it is better. You know why it's better? Because it's more expensive. Because it's more expensive, right? <laughs> more profits. What is it? It's like thousands of dollars every month. Oh, well, I calculated that everybody in the United Kingdom um, took a PCSK9, whichever one it was, uh, Fourier's, I think it's, well, that was a study. Um, it would cost the NHS 70% of its entire budget for everything. That would be it. There would be 70% of the entire budget yeah. of the National Health Service would be spent on one drug. I mean, that, that is a fact. Okay. Uh, and, and then we've got another one that's coming out. It's called Inclisiran, which is the latest one. They call it a vaccine now, don't they? A vaccine against cholesterol. And, um, uh, and, and, and that's been launched despite the fact that, despite all the studies they've done, they can find no impact on any cardiovascular outcome whatsoever. It's been launched purely on its ability to lower LDL. And it has no outcome data whatsoever. And somehow or other, they've managed to convince the NHS to prescribe this, it's like God, that, that. That is a that is a clever game, uh, oh, and it's billions. It's billions and billions and billions. And you know, and everyone, all the economies in the world are struggling, and these companies are coming out with drugs that have no benefit for anyone at anything. Do, do you know billion. what the number? What the, was the number? Say two years ago, what was the number one selling drug in the world from a, from a revenue perspective? Two years ago. Yeah, two mm. years ago. I don't know. I don't know actually. What Up until last year, even last year. Even. Last well, it was probably still Lipitor, wasn't it? I don't. Yeah, it was. That's right. so statins. You're right. Yeah. Collectively, the statins are a trillion dollars worth of sales. But you yeah. know what's ecl what's eclipsed that? And Lipitor was by Pfizer. In case you don't, yeah. <laughs> those who don't know, that was <laughs> Pfizer drug. So Fi so that 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 drug got displaced. You know what displaced it? Yeah, probably you know, Rovi Rovi nope. I don't. Know. Nope. Yeah. The Pfizer jab. $35 billion last year, $35 billion. Oh, it's, it's, it's literally two, yeah. three, four times more revenue than the drugs. And the additional benefit, no liability. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just... <laughs> anyway, we can go on. It's a good, bit, and forth. It's a good business mean, it's, to be in, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't dream this stuff, make this stuff up. It's just like, yeah, yeah right, sure. We're going <laughs> to... And, and then we're going to have the government force everyone to take it. <laughs> yes. No, that's, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, uh, and it's been tens of billions of dollars advertising and trying to manipulate people and thinking how good it is. And we, you don't have to pay for it because the government's going to pay for it. But anyway, we can go on and on forever and ever. But I want to get into some of the, you know, rather than the, continue to disparage, righteous, righteously disparage these companies, <laughs> let's talk about things we can do. And because you do offer a lot of good strategies in there that really are focused on repairing, rebuilding, and maintaining the endothelium so that you radically minimize your risk for this thrombosis. Yeah. So, um, to go actually, before we start that, because one of the strategies you're going to recommend, I want to dialogue on, but before we have that dialogue, I wanted to discuss one thing that really wasn't mentioned in your book and really the only flaw I could find in it because of its absence, not because you said something to disagree with, it just didn't include it. And I just don't think you may be aware of it, which is not surprising because you, and you're a great example of someone who's absolutely committed to understanding the foundational causes of disease. And yet this escaped you as it has escaped almost, I'd say 95% of the people who are like yourself, who are physicians, who are really have abandoned the conventional paradigm and seeking to understand the foundational truths. So that, and that, that what was missing from the book was, an, uh, 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 from my perspective, was the uh, ability, not the ability, the mentioning that uh, omega-6 fats, specifically linoleic acid, that the excess consumption of these fats over the last 150 years, in my view, may be the single biggest reason 
why we're having these problems because they lead into all the other issues, you know, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, the obesity, these are all, and actually you did, did a good job in the book about obesity too, and this and really annihilating that as a risk factor. Uh, but the, in, in, you know, the insulin resistance, uh, clearly it's this excess of linoleic acid, literally five, 10 times higher than we were ever designed to consume. And by the, and how does it do it by generating, uh, getting embedded first in the cell membranes. And so it sticks around for years, seven years to get it out of your system. Unlike eating sugar, which you got it out that, that day, it's gone. It doesn't stick around, except maybe in the form of fat if you metabolize it. But uh, the, so these, the, when, you, but when you have large amounts of this, it creates excess oxidative stress, which I believe, and this is what I wanted you to comment on, we can dialogue about this a bit before we go into the, the other strategies, but is that it, this oxidative stress is generated from metabolic byproducts, they call them oxalans, oxidative linoleic acid metabolites that go in there and radically cause, cause an increase in these free radicals, which I believe go in there and damage the endothelium. So that was my only uh, negative comment on the book. <laughs> Just it didn't go into that details. Those, well, that, well, you know, if you only got one, that's great. <laughs> that's it, that was it. it, it it's no, no, I, I, I look, I looked at the, I've looked at the omega-6 and omega-3s. I got myself so confused about what I was looking at and what data I was seeing. I mean, I do know that one of the very first experiments done on replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat, and that was primarily omega-6. Mm -hmm. so the Rose study, and there was a Sydney Heart study. Omega six, right. and, uh, and then what they found was that the, the LDL level went down, or the cholesterol they went, they didn't do LDL level at that time. Cholesterol mm -hmm. level went down, but the heart disease rate and the mortality went, rate went up. up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Ansel Keys did a thing called the Minnesota Coronary Experiment, where he did precisely the same thing, but he did it on a lot more people. It was about 10,000. And, and they replaced saturated fats with omega-6 primarily, I think entirely mm -hmm. with omega-6. And what they found is that for every 1% drop in the LDL, that was cholesterol rather than LDL, every 1% drop in the cholesterol level resulted in a 2% increase in mortality. So, so yes, Omega six is, and in fact, they, they, as you know, in Israel they they called it the perfect experiment, where where they uh, a lot of people um, were told to take omega sixes, and boy, it it did them no good at all. So yes, omega sixes are unhealthy things. I know this. I know the proportion of omega six to omega threes is 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 quite a is a highly important thing in how the body works. And you are absolutely right that if you take the wrong type of um, of, of fat, fatty acids, as they call, which most people call fats, that they do become incorporated into the membranes of cells. And once you've got wonky cell membranes, then your entire body mm -hmm. system is, 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 is damaged. Because we know that, that, of course it is, because- For years. Everything, well, every, everything, is, everything is about uh, how the cell internal, what's called the, the internal environment of the cell, is controlled, the things it lets in, the things it lets out, the, all the mechanisms are, are, are dependent on, on activity, well, not all of the mechanisms, but a huge number are dependent on what happens at that cell membrane interface. Mm -hmm. and, and that's incredibly important. I mean, it's one of my things is like, well, cholesterol itself is very important in, in cell membrane structure and, and integrity and, and all sorts of functions. So if you lower the, the cholesterol levels too much, you can also cause problems. So I, I'm going to Going to, going to admit I looked at it and kind of backed off because I got a bit confused about it. <laughs> so, I'm going to send you some literature that will clear up the confusion because you're a smart guy, you know how to solve puzzles, and I just I, you just never had the data, so I'm going to send that to you to understand. Well, it. But I'll tell you why it's going to help clear up some of your other confusion too. Because in the therapy section, which I want to go into now, you talked about the the and you're one of the few people who advocate this is is recommending sunshine on a regular basis. And we'll talk yes. about why, but then you, you address the issue of the pe many people's, especially dermatologists concerned, the increased risk of skin cancers. And yes, it does increase the risk of skin cancers, not so much melanoma, but it does basal and squamous cell carcinoma. And it, but here's, here's the missing link that you didn't understand. It increases it because of the higher ingestion of linoleic acid. It's only when you combine 
sun exposure and high linoleic acid content in the skin that it causes the cancer because you don't have the destructive damage. In fact, as a, as a classic illustration of this, once you get your linoleic acid levels low, it becomes very, very difficult to ever get sunburned, which is yes. extraordinary because it's, it's, it's the damaged linoleic acid fatty acids that are in your skin that's causing the problem. That's interesting. I mean, I have heard this, uh, you know, as you know yourself, there's so many things you can look at and you think, right, right. I've got time. Well, this is, this is you. This is you. I mean, that, that as, a, as a mechanism sounds entirely plausible to me and I'm, uh, I haven't looked at it in, in, in enough detail. Yeah, no. yeah, it's not that, you know, you just, you just, there's only something you can do and you just haven't examined the literature. That's what I want to send to you. But, the, but you had mentioned that and many people think that sun exposure is just vitamin D, but it's not. And why don't you go into it and tell us how it's our old friend nitric oxide comes well, back? Well, it's our old friend nitric oxide. You know, we have nitric stores. I'm not quite sure how they're stored in cells, but when you when you the sun is exposed, I, I had the same question when I was writing my EMF book. How did, is it stored up in some vesicle? I don't think it really is. I, well, it, it must be somewhere. Anyway, wherever it is or whatever, however it's stored, is if you expose the sun, uh, the skin to the sun, you you get nitric oxide produced. And it lowers the blood pressure and it protects the endothelium and it has all sorts of other beneficial effects because nitric oxide is, is terribly beneficial. And, um, and so, you know, we look at vitamin D and vitamin D is, of course, important, it is a hugely important um, uh, hormone. Um, it's not really a vitamin, is it? But um, and yeah, well, the nitric oxide, they, they, they did a study in Denmark or Sweden that I wrote the book. I should know. I think it was Denmark, but it might be Sweden. Well, they looked at women who had low sun exposure rates and women who had high sun exposure rates basically went sunbathing and they found that the decrease in life expectancy with not exposing yourself to the sun was equivalent to smoking 20 to 40 cigarettes a day in other words sun exposure decreased your risk by that equivalent amount years of extra life expectancy and yet we're all told to stay out of the sun and you think god this is just bonkers i mean the dermatologists who've got who've taken over the world when it comes to skin cancers scream and yell and go blue in the face. The reality is malignant melanoma is not caused by excess sun exposure. Other, as you say, as you rightly say, squamous cell, basal cell, rodent ulcers, actinic keratosis. These are sun exposure problems. But you can reduce skin. those if you have low linoleic yeah. acid. Yes, well, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I can show uh, you I think that's fascinating, and I, I intend fully to, to, to look at that. Yeah, I'll, because, I'll send you a, a good yeah. starter. But, but yeah. it gets even better because in the book, you put the proper framework on strategies. Like, okay, can I take a statin? Now, how, how many months or years am I going to get if I take a statin every day yeah. the rest of my life versus going in the sun? So why don't you enlighten us with those stats? <laughs> well, if I can remember them exactly. Uh, well, the thing is that... Um, Yes, in the end, what you want to do is increase your life expectancy. And presumably that also helps it increase your healthy life expectancy. <laughs> what very few people do is, is put it in these terms of how much extra life expectancy will you get if you do X, Y, or Z? They'll talk about reduction in risk as a relative risk and mm -hmm. it, whatever. The, the analysis, this is not my analysis, I did one myself, which I failed to get published, of how much longer will you live if you take a statin it's assuming the clinical trials are all correct, we'll not go down that route, is uh, for one year of taking a statin, you will gain, you'll gain 0.6 of a day of increased life expectancy at best. That's a half of a day. That We're talking 12 uh -huh. hours, well, maybe 10. We're talking 12 hours per year. So you can extend that if you want. If you take them for 40 years, you get 40 times 12 hours, which is whatever it is. 20 days. Um, Many days, yeah, that's it. And that, those are the figures. These are not my figures. These are the figures from the clinical trials. So you think, so I take a statin for 40 years and I get 20 days of extra life expectancy, like big deal. Uh, if yeah. you explain that to most people, they go, well, I'm not taking that damn thing. Or some people might, who knows? But if you, if you went, if you did sunbathing, for instance, uh, rather than not sunbathing, you could get about four to six years of increased life expectancy. So we're talking about something that is, is hundreds, is it well, thousands? Many orders of magnitude better. Many just orders of magnitude more important for your health. So, so yeah, when we're focusing in on things like lowering your blood pressure, yes, you're getting 
you get something like about twice the amount of benefit as you get from statins. Obviously, it's a super high blood pressure. Yes, get it down. But the, the sort of blood pressure that most people have, we're talking rather disappointingly small benefits. I mean, we're talking, well, I, I think I was being over optimistic, but we say take maybe three months or something for 40 years. So these are the real figures. These are not, by the way, made up figures. These are figures from the clinical trials. You just have to present them and frame them in a different way. So you're talking about things that can really make a difference and things that really make it harm you, you've got to look at it. I, I think you've got to look at it in this way. And so few people, well, I don't think I've ever seen it done before. Maybe I've seen people look at, you know, actual increase in life expectancy in days, weeks or months or decreases in days, weeks or months. But I've never seen anyone try and say, well, okay, so, so what happens if you lower the blood pressure? So what happens if you go in the sun? So what happens if you stop smoking? So what happens if you do this and that? At how much... I was thinking of getting a little man and basically shrinking him down and expanding him up to give a visual, but I couldn't really make sure. it work. But, uh, but it was really just to give people an idea. So the, the, the greatest decrease in life expectancy are from things like mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. We showed that the average life expectancy in schizophrenia is, is, is 48 years. Um, and, and that is 48, just, four, eight. It's four, it's four, half your life expectancy is basically gone, isn't it? Wow. I mean, they have all sorts of problems, but I mean, we're, you know, you know, measure that against, you know, how much life expectancy are you going to reduce if you have a high LDL level? The answer is it doesn't reduce it at all if you look at the figures. So, so we're, we're, we're panicking over things like raised blood pressure, raised cholesterol levels and, uh, and obesity, which when you look at them, mate, I couldn't even find if you look at the, 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 the figures. You can't even find uh, figures for for obesity on on life expectancy. Yeah, and you, you, you you reviewed some compelling data in the book too about the BMI, uh, yeah, yeah. because we're all, all led to believe, oh, we got to get a BMI between twenty and twenty five, which is normal weight, yeah. and anything above is going to be problematic. But actually, when you the the, stat, the data you reviewed showed that actually, if you have the normal BMI, you're at a higher risk of death. You need a you need a higher BMI from twenty five to thirty. You just don't yeah. need a a grossly high view. Yes. Well, they well they do this thing what I call it's it's mismatched anyway. But so they so they put people into different sections like BMI eighteen point five or whatever it is to mm -hmm. to twenty or very low blood BMIs and twenty to twenty five, twenty five to thirty, and then they have thirty and above, and they go yeah, well, yeah. if you're overweight, it's damaging to your. But that includes people who've got BMIs of, of like seventy and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> It's like what they do is with drinking, they do this sort of zero drinks, zero to one drinks a week, one to two, and then they have two and above. And you go, well, drinking two and above is damaging. You go, well, well, if you include, you know, st stunned alcoholics who are drinking three bottles of vodka a day, well, surprise, surprise. So if you look at BMI, basically the, the longest lived BMI in all the studies I've ever seen is between 25 and 30. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 20 to 25, 25 to 30. Frankly, the differences are you're probably talking three days or 10 days. And, mm -hmm. and, and 30 to 35 was actually lower, longer life expectancy than 20 to 25. Once wow. you get above 35, bang, if you've got other things going on. So, mm -hmm. so we are terrified of things that really are, are we shouldn't be getting terrified of. But the, the BMI ones, when I get most flack from people going, that just is not true. <laughs> well, here's all the data. You find some data to contradict me. Um, and they can't, but they still don't believe it because they've been told. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and, and if you're for ideally optimally healthy people, we're talking professional fit athletes who ostensibly would be 50, 60 pounds overweight, but it's all muscle mass. <laughs> it's not adipose tissue. It's lean muscle mass. So you have American, they're, they're, you have American football. Over, over here we have rugby and the, uh, the, the, the players who play at the front, what they call the pack, they did an analysis of the England front eight in rugby, and every single one of them was was a beast. And yet, if you look at them, just like it's just muscle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. But but BMI will catch up. They'll be over thirty for sure. Thirty. Oh, they're well, they're over, some of them are over thirty five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's huge. These guys you don't want to pick but a fight. It doesn't them. mean they're unhealthy. So I mean, it's a perverted. Oh. It's not really a great tool. I mean, body fat. It, well, it, it, really I better. mean, the tool is. The tool but is but really, it's harder to calculate. Yeah. You know, so they the don't, tool is really meant to help. Yeah, as you know. Yeah. So. Um, 
Now, aside from the mental illness and mental health perspective, that's hard to tackle and it would be like, I mean, that's a whole book by itself, let alone you know, yeah. wrapping it up at the end. But one of the best simple interventions, I mean, far exceeding stopping smoking would be getting regular sun exposure. And ideally, th thankfully, we have a simple tool that you can use that is a marker for if you're getting enough sun exposure. Do you know what that tool is? Yeah. But anyway, don't get burnt. <laughs> no, no, no. The tool to know that if you're getting enough sun exposure. Is, oh, I don't know. What is it? It's called yeah, vitamin, D, vitamin D. Oh, vitamin. oh well, sorry. yeah, of course. Yeah, so assuming <laughs> you're not taking supplemental vitamin D. Now, I haven't taken vitamin D in 11, 12 years now. And I just got my results back last week. And this is the middle of January, towards the end of January. And it was 61 uh, just by sun exposure. And so you can do it without it. And, and so the, the, the point of that being is not this brag, oh, I'd like to, to boast about that. It's the issue is that if you can validate, if you can optimize your vitamin D level into the biological healthy ranges of 60 to 80 nanograms per milliliter, 150 to 200 nanomoles per liter on your side of the pond, yeah. uh, then you are getting pretty significant nitric oxide production from that exposure. No question yeah. about it. You don't have to measure it. And I don't even think you can measure it outside of a, a, a research. Oh, no, you, you, you can't outside of a research. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but you, you, you don't have to. You can do a simple blood test and, it's, and, and it lasts a long time. So it doesn't have to be done like fasting or anything. It's just you know, simple to do. So I would put that number one. Number two, I would put is the linoleic acid reduction. And I'm pretty confident that you'll agree with me after you review the literature. But aside from that, what, you know, what would you rank as number two as the best intervention? Well, I think uh, we've talked about the metabolic health thing. And I think that's that if you have a problem with metabolic health, which more people have than they 90 percent, 90 percent of the population. <laughs> well, then then what you need to do is lower your insulin levels and your blood sugar levels. And, um, and that is in part, well, you've got to stop eating so many damn carbohydrates because carbohydrates stimulate insulin production. They, but they do. Do you know what, oh, but what was maybe more significant, this is, this relates to the linoleic acid again, because I am convinced that yes, carbohydrates are not optimal and most people eat too many, but they're actually healthy. You need a certain basal level of carbohydrates. And I probably have between hundred and 150 and I have, I'm metabolically fit on steroids. I can tell you. And the um, the issue is if you don't get enough carbs, it's actually problematic. But in the in the interventional trip phase, and if you you know you're really grossly overweight and you're insulin resistant, then you're going to want to reduce it. But it's the linoleic acid that's far more profound an indicator of diabetes and re insulin resistance than anything else. So you've got to integrate that into the equation. It's the it's you do that and you've got the best book out there. That's the only piece of the puzzle you were missing because it's so essential, but you're right. The, the, the key central point is lower your insulin resistance, optimize your blood sugar levels and insulin levels. And the best way to do this is lower linoleic acid exercise and have healthy amounts of carbs, and healthy carbs too. Yes, like for, and, and also I think that, that I do suggest lifestyle relaxation because stress is still, mm -hmm. in my opinion, a, a It raises blood sugar too, right? It raises yeah. the blood sugar. Uh, right, well, it, does, it raises blood sugar makes your blood more ready to clot. The, the, it, it inhibits the, the repair systems. That, you know, if it's a damage versus repair situation, if you're under, under stress or strain, your repair systems are just not working as well. And, and so there's a whole series of things. In fact, cortisol, which is one of the key stress hormones, reduces endothelial progenitor cell production in, in the bone marrow, for example. So, so there's, a, there's a whole also series there. So I think that trying to relax and enjoy your life and have good relationships with other people and, and, and avoid being bullied and, and oppressed. These sort of things are, are, are also important because I think the mental state is, 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 a, is a critical part of our physical health. And, I, and I'm very strong on that, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously going to have to go and look up Linoleic acid, you're going to send yeah, me Yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to get I'm, I'm going to read it, and then I, I, might, I might write the clock things too. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, just maybe yeah, if I could be bothered with the existing way. But I think it's a good place to end it on. Uh, I mean, we go on for hours and hours. You're such a delight to yeah. connect with. Uh, but the key here uh, is the clot thickens is the book. If you want more information, highly recommended. I really, if you're a health advocate and a health nut, uh, and you really want a 
good library, this is one you really should have because it, it gets to the foundational pieces and you can, it helps you understand what the issues are so that even if new stuff comes in like COVID and discards COVID-2, you can understand how this fits into the picture and what it's causing and how it's causing all these complications because cardiovascular health is really important. And this is a profoundly useful book. And I so appreciate you, your commitment to finding the truth, your, your perpetual curiosity and seeking to find the foundational causes of disease and help us with uh, understanding the solutions. So really appreciate you and uh, you keep up the good work. You're doing such a good job. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. I can, I can call you that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. appreciate it very much. And uh, yep, yep, we, we, we need to contact again. And if you send me that stuff on linoleic acid, I promise, cross my heart, et cetera. I will read it and you know, I, I love new ideas. I love new thinking. I love to see it in a different perspective. And, uh, and that's fantastic when that happens. It's the best thing. All right. Well, great. Thanks so much for watching. Remember, hit the like and subscribe button so you can get more videos that can help you and your family take control of your health.